it is. Video four. Video four. At last. last. At last. <laughs> so, what are the key messages, do you reckon, from the previous three videos that we've done? Well, what we've tried to show in, in videos one, two, and three are the elements that go together to make that core cool shadows tone of, of Hank Marvin. Yeah. Um, and we started with his Strat, the, the guitar itself, and with modern instruments, the type of pickups that you have on it, uh, the strings in it. Um, we talked then about going from the guitar to an echo unit that gives you that core, very distinct shadow sound, and we're using a TVS3. Yeah. If you happen to have a Miazzi, a good Miazzi, then you could use that as well. Yeah. From that to uh, a Vox amp, uh, preferably with an English Celestian Blue loudspeaker. Yes. And then for recording, there's the microphone position is critical to get the sound. And then in your recording, how you treat that in terms of equalisation and subsequent polishing of the sound. Yeah. And those first three videos went through all of that in detail. Um, the key thing which I haven't mentioned though is playing style of course and yes. that's going to be a large part of, of this video. And I, I guess a question that we often have is, well look I've got all those things, I've got a good strat, I've got the pickups you recommend and the yeah, strings, yeah. I've got a TVS3, I've and got I still a don't sound like Hank. Exactly, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. How, how can we move further down that path? Yeah. And the, the critical thing is of course just having the boxes, the hardware boxes, isn't the story. It's uh, what settings you're using on it. Do you have the appropriate yes. channel for the early shadow stuff, which yes. is a, a normal channel, yes. or do you have a top boost channel for the later stuff? Yeah. And in the earlier videos, we mentioned on the uh, gear sheet, which amplifier and which setting is appropriate for which song of which era. Yeah. Uh, if you're recording for posting sound files or for your own satisfaction, microphone placement yeah. is critical and we've gone into how, how to adjust that. Then when you do record it, you quite often need to apply some equalisation because it's highly likely that the engineers at Abbey Road might have applied a little bit as well. I reckon they would have done. They would have done. Yeah. But with their different microphones, different studio, different microphone yeah. placements, yeah. different mixing desks, yes. all of those things, there are differences in sound. And we just put them all into one basket and say, let's yeah. equalise it and get it, see how yeah. close we can get. I don't know whether this is the right time to ask, but one of the one of the the questions that I know you get asked a lot is, where do you put your knobs? Where do you put the knobs here? And that's a question we refuse to answer. It, because we have a, no idea. For a very good reason, <laughs> because for every setup they'll be different. Yeah. Yeah. And people, particularly with the TVS, say, well, what knob settings do I use for this tune? Yeah, yeah. It depends on your instrument, on the output level of the instrument, on how hard you pick it, yeah. on your playing style. And even on the day. I, I know from, yes. from experience you can, you can, you can have a great sound in the studio, yes. um, finish for the day, yep. come back the yep. next day, having touched nothing, yes. play again, and it sounds completely different. That's right, that's right. We uh, don't know why, but it happens. Yeah, uh, these are all the, the subtleties of yeah. sound which yeah. make it yeah. so interesting. Yeah. Um, and uh, as we tried to show in the first video, equalisation really though can only be used to polish the sound. If the coarse tone isn't there from the start, you forget it. There's no way you, there's no way you can get it in. And yeah. that will come out. So that's just some of the background stuff with, with your equipment on the things which are necessary to set up. Yeah. But we come back again to this final thing, playing style. Yeah because without the playing style, it ain't gonna sound right. And if I think back to, to a, a great expression that I picked up in my days as a physics student, it's necessary but not sufficient. Mm. So having the right guitar, echo unit, amp, mic, setting your knobs correctly yeah. is necessary to get the genuine shadow sound, but yeah. it's not sufficient. Yes. And yeah. the missing piece, of course, is the playing style. Right. And we all acknowledge Hank's mastery in this area, and that's what we're trying to emulate. So, Let's just take a couple of the numbers that we have demonstrated so far right. and try and show the key bits of style and playing position on the guitar. I'll try. <laughs> and show you how it brings out the, the, the character of the sound when it's done properly. Okay, <laughs> okay so if we start off with, with Peace Pipe, what we discovered when we are trying to get really close to Hank's sound is that where you play things on the fingerboard, of course, is critical to yes. getting that sound. Yes, yes. And if you don't play it in the right place, no amount of equalisation and fiddling can ever get the sound. This, of the I mean, we should qualify this. This is yes. if you want to get the exact sound yes. of the record or as close as you can. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. yes. So, 
over to Gary. Oh, well, Peace Pipe. Yes. Uh, the, the very beginning of it. The very beginning. Uh, all right. Uh, I've got to remember this because I haven't, I haven't been doing it right. Um, Paul tells me. Let's see. Yeah. So these two notes ring together. That's right. And that's the key thing. If you listen to the original of Peace Pipe, you can hear those notes ringing. Yes. Hank subsequently, and if you look at the final two of video, plays it down. I was with him when he was rehearsing, yes. and I thought, ah, this is the way to get yeah. Peace And that's where Hank plays it now. Because he went to the difference. He went. Yeah. Later in the melody, uh, there is this interlude, and again, there are various places you can play it on the yeah. fingerboard, but there yeah. is only one that has the right core tone, and in particular, the right sound as you go across the strings in the guitar. Right, and it, we think it's here. Yes. That's a very good audio cue. Um, quite often you can hear in the original recording where the notes are ringing together. That's right. And if your playing position on the fingerboard yeah. isn't giving you that ringing together, yeah. you're yeah. in the wrong position. But you've got to listen really hard, oh, don't yes. you? Yes, I mean, you do. Really, really hard. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, that's right. Um, then later on we go into the lower notes and the low strings. Uh, so we start yeah. on the A string. the open strings and a little bit of uh, tonal adjustment with equalization and all the things yeah. we said in the earlier videos yes. gives you that core tone. A lot of people play in the fifth position. Totally different sound you can never yeah. You can't get it back to the original. No, that's yeah. right. So there's yeah. that one. Um, and a key thing for Peace Pipe too is it's all played on the neck pickup. Yeah, a lot of people think you switch to the to the bridge for, yeah. the, for the low bit. Yeah, no, but in fact it isn't because as we mentioned in video three, there's a lot of bass cut in the equalisation for Peace Pipe yeah. and that's what gives that yeah. thin, aggressive sort of sound, not yeah. a pickup change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what about the damp notes in Peace Pipe then? Okay. And what um, are the tricks to play them properly? Well, one of the tricks with damping is, is not to damp too far up the strings because it can make your it can sharpen sharpen the note if you damp too far yeah. up uh, and also not to push down too hard when you're not to to, to to lean too heavily on 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 the bridge because if you do the thing's going to go sharp yeah. not on this guitar because it's got springs that would hold up a well um, it's pretty it's, it's pretty tough this one but but yeah uh, don't press down too hard on the bridge yeah, because um, you, you want the the tone of the note to ring through still, and not right. just get a dull click. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yep, great. Like, like so. Like so. And same in Wonderful Land, of course, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. You want the, the tone of the note to be there, yeah. but you want it to be damped enough so you get the, the rippling echo effect following it on. That's right. Okay, what, a, what about Apache? What are the tricks there? Um, well, uh, okay, the intro. That's the right. intro. Um, I think most people know how, 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 to, how to how to do the intro, but the way I do it, not the way I think Hank did it. And you get that change of pitch there with string bending rather than rather than trim. pulling up on yeah. the track. Well, yeah. I, I suppose you could do it if you if you really it's hard can't to get it accurate on the other. Very hard to get accurate um, pitch that way. Yeah, it, I mean, yeah. It, it, it tends to last too long yeah. somehow. Yeah, um, yeah so yep. I, I'd bend the string. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right, uh, what's the next bit on there? The tune, the, the main. Melody, just the melody. Down. Perhaps if you want to be slavish to the record with a, yes. with a, a little bit of damping. Yes, a little, very, very light damping. Yes. As, as we pointed out in the earlier videos, the guitar that Hank was using then, yeah. his original strap, had a very dead. Uh, D string. Yes, yes. And it, that comes out. And indeed, it comes out in all the tunes of that era. If you listen to Find Me a Golden Street, 
So you, can, you can pick the notes on the D string. They're absolutely dead. Yeah. And that's what gives it a different echo. You must have made those strings last a very long time. <laughs> yeah, I think he did, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. yes, so we've commented on that, that earlier on, of course. Yeah. Um, the gallop. Um, um, here, accurate um, kickings is critical to It is. Part it's harder than it seems, actually. Yes, um, yes. I, I sometimes find in the heat of battle when I'm playing this <laughs> yes. one um, yes. uh, live yes. uh, that I, if I'm going to mess up anything, yes. I'll mess up that bit. Yes. Yep. Um, uh, a lot of people get the pattern wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'll, do, I'll just do yes. it slowly. There's the damp run through the melody. It's become popular to play that up on the fifth fret. I've seen Hank do that. Yes, he does, but yeah. originally he played it down there. Yeah, so I think so. But it's thicker, it's yeah, thicker. Yeah, okay. And then there's the lovely bit where you slide. Oh, uh, this is. That's a real sort of karate yes. chop. Um, yes. And a little gentle wobble on the yes. end of it. And indeed, if you just press down on the trim arm there, it's easier to get the pitch right rather than yes. grab hold. If you grab hold of it too hard, you're, yeah. you're overkill. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. We, we also mentioned in video three with Apache, there's very little use of the trim arm, in fact, in yeah. the melody. Yeah. Yeah. Most yeah. modern players overdo it a, a little bit. As indeed did Hank after about 1960. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We've, we've been. Through that with the yeah, Apache yeah. Uh, journey. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, the other one we did was uh, Atlantis, but it's fairly straightforward again. Well, you should um, play that. Oh, go on. Okay, Atlantis. The, Atlantis. Um, Atlantis is interesting because it was clearly recorded in a couple of different parts. The opening bits. up here on, on the 12th fret with quite a lot of echo yeah, yeah. and using the neck pickup. The melody however is the bridge pickup with far less echo. First of all I'll play it with, with that same echo setting. Doesn't sound too bad. Now I'll just reduce the echo to almost zero and it will sound dry, but when it's mixed in with the backing, in fact it will sound right. And that's the way it is on the, on the actual recording. Mm. Then the melody is repeated higher up the fingerboard, and again, the only way to get the right tone match is to play it in this position. And so on. And so on. And so on. Um, and then one goes back uh, ultimately back to the to the intro as sure, the outro sure. again. Yeah. Um, it just occurred to me a, a good example of the differences in tone as one plays along the fingerboard was the boys. Um, when I tried to match the shadows here, it took a long, long time to actually figure out where Hank had played. There are many different places you can play the single melody up and down the fingerboard, yeah. but only one can actually get you close to Hank's original sound. Yes. But the options are something like this. Yeah. And you can yeah. hear the difference in tone as we go down. I tried all of these with different equalisation and all different things. There's only one that works, and it's this one. It has that open sort of plummy mm -hmm. sound without getting too plummy up here. Or even further up here, which is yes. where we play. Yes. Picking, picking. <clears throat> the strange thing about Hank, and of course I, I know a lot of people know this, Hank picks upwards. Yes. Um, I find this very odd, very, I don't know, I asked him where, where, where he got 
the notion to pick up is from, and he doesn't know, it just came naturally to him. Yes. But it very much affects mm. um, his playing style mm. and the sound that the plectrum makes when it hits the strings. Yes. Big difference between picking up with, well, I see, I can't, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> very kind. Um, uh, I'm not very, I mean, on a number like um, a Fryan City mm. or something, you, you can just swipe at them. Um, what is it? Um, I don't know, like an echo. No, one, probably, probably, probably not, but it doesn't yes. really matter. Um, and you can just swipe at it, and the chances are you're going to hit something in the, in the vicinity. But when it comes to playing um, something like Peace Pipe, mm. I find that very hard indeed. Mm. Um, 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 Peace Pipe. I don't know whether it's possible to hear the difference on, on, on this particular mm. recording. But Hank plays um, uh, a, a, a lot of up-picking. Mm, mm. um, and if that's your thing, well, you're halfway there. Mm. But uh, it's another interesting yeah. variation. It's something yeah. that you can play around with. You know. yes. And certainly some things I mentioned find me a Golden <coughs> Street before an Apache with that dead string. Yes. The deadness is accentuated if you sort of pick up Yes. And out just a little bit as opposed to pressing down and in. And there's all these subtleties which are in there. So if people really want to be <laughs> come an anorak. Put dead strings on a guitar. <laughs> that's what you've got to do. Yeah. There's lots of variations like that. And, yeah. and that's part of the fun of it. Yeah, it, fun is. Of the it, is. Yeah. it is. It is. Okay, so th th that's just a couple of things we found in trying to match yeah. Hank's original tone. Yes. Um, and so if you find with your equipment, um, and a lot of twiddling and fiddling, you're still not getting the sound, that's a very good place to look. It's a good place yes. to start. Uh, yeah. yeah, are you playing it yeah. in the right place? Because yeah. if you're not, you're not going to be able to get yeah. that sound. Yes. Uh, for, for people um, who want to play at their local Shadows Club and at home, um, and they ask uh, questions like, what settings do we need to have? What, what can we tell them? Yeah, well here we're of course talking about live performance rather than recorded performance. Okay. We've, we've done a lot of work in the early videos and this one on recorded performance. For live performance, um, unless you're playing at a gig in a large venue, and we'll get Gary to comment on that in just a moment, um, you or the audience probably want to hear something that sounds pretty close to the record. That's the benchmark for it. Mm -hmm. And that means changing settings between each individual song. So you've got to have, for Apache, you need to have the Apache echo on your echo unit. Mm. You need to have a normal channel on the amplifier, not top boost. You need the control set up appropriately. If your next song is Wonderful Land, you need a different echo. You need to go to the top boost channel on the amplifier. So to match the recorded sound, there's a lot of messing around between each individual song. Yeah. Um, Ultimately, where do you set the knobs again? You've got to be judged by your ear. Yeah. It's only by listening to it and comparing that to the actual live, uh, recorded sound of the shadows right. can mm -hmm. you get in the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now that's fine if you're doing it for your own pleasure or for the pleasure of your fellow mm -hmm. Shadows Club mm -hmm. members. But of course, if you're playing in a large venue, that's not going to work. Uh, unless you've got a very smart technician doing <laughs> all the switching and swapping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here, Hank these days, and most people who play Shadows music to in larger venues would go for a generic sound, and Gary could comment on this because he does it all the time. I do all the time. <laughs> uh, well, I do. Yes. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, when it comes right down to it, um, I only use about two or three echoes. Mm. I, use, um, I use Atlantis for most things. Yes. You've got to use the Apache echo yeah. for Apache, yeah. Yeah. but Atlantis covers most, most yeah. stuff, yeah. and no one has ever come up to me and said, you're using the wrong echo. <laughs> it just never happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so if you come up with a, 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 what you consider to be a good generic sound yeah. and you play it reasonably well, yeah. um, that will satisfy most punters. It really, yeah. really will. That's right. Yeah. I mean, you might get the odd Shadows Club member who comes yeah. up and says, yeah. <laughs> you're doing it all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> it, I deal with them. Take them outside. Yeah, yeah. Beat the crap yeah. Have a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of common faults we come across with our local Shadows Club also and other venues and that's people quite often don't use the tone controls on their amplifier properly you know so they've got this sort of really harsh treble that sort of put 
takes the enamel off your teeth. Well, that's exploded. true. Well, one of, that's one of the problems, yeah. I reckon, with yeah. playing live and, yeah. and, and getting the sound on the record. If you used the sound, for example, on Atlantis mm. uh, uh, live, that one needs to get to try and recreate the mm. record, I think it would take the top of people's heads off. Yeah. It's pretty nasty yeah. in a live situation. Yep, yeah. and, it, it's and getting, this is one of the yeah. reasons, I think, that yeah. Hank is often accused yes. of not having his you know, original sound when he plays live. I think he's decided that uh, you know, having a, a, a really nice generic yes. sound, a la Kingston, yes. is actually where it's at yeah. from, a, from a live point of view. And I, I agree with him. Yeah. And in fact, it's probably all you can do in a live situation because you don't have the benefits of close miking and yeah. all the stuff that and goes with And you'd be twiddling that. knobs endlessly yes. in between numbers, which drives your audience yes. nuts. That's right. Because it's boring. Yeah. So, again, I mean, uh, there's a couple of things come out of this discussion. I mean, trying to match the recorded sound live is difficult. Yeah. yeah. It's quite difficult. It can be done, but it takes a lot of setting up for each tune. Um, it takes uh, a backing that's sympathetic to what you're playing and not, yeah. not a drummer bashing his brains yeah. out on the drums and yeah. all that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And to strive for a live sound, probably Kingston is the benchmark rather than the, the sure recorded sound. I'm sure it is. Yes. And most of us would be very happy if we could reproduce that. Absolutely. And as Gary's commented in an earlier video as well, once you're set up for a live sound, even changing pickups can be problematic. If you've got a good sound on the bridge pickup for Apache mm. Mm. and you then flick it over for the neck pickup for Peace Pipe, mm. it probably won't sound very good at all. And mm. this is why Hank quite often now doesn't change his pickups very much. Yes. So, but again... Some people on the side have commented, well, he could have a, one of those switcher units. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. I suppose he could. Yes. But I think, that, again, it, it raises the point that most of the people that you're playing to who aren't guitar nuts, they're just people who like the music, yes. Um, they don't care about that stuff. Yeah, that's right. If you're in the area and you're playing it yeah. well, yeah. it'll transport them. And really, that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I found interesting was, you know, uh, with the last tour playing at different venues, um, they, they usually had basically the same setup. Mm. Yet the sound was different from venue to venue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And in some cases, it was the sound. In other cases, it was way off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's the sort of problem you're coming against with when you're changing venues. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, in those cases too, they're, they're miking up the amplifiers, mm. and so it depends also on the sound engineers. Mm. They're placing the microphones. Probably they are in the same position. They're all marked on the amplifier. Well, I'm sure so they are in the same position. And the amps would be, because I, I know yep. that Hank doesn't change his sound no. on his amplifier. Yep. Um, he gets his sound, yep. and the microphone's in the same place. Yep. And then, really, the only problem is yep. dealing with the acoustics That's of the, the venue, venue. Yep. Uh, which can vary enormously. It makes it a difference. huge problem for yeah, somebody else. Yeah. But as long as yeah. he's making the sound that he makes, yeah. that's somebody yeah. else's problem. So I'm sorry we can't tell you where to put your knobs again mm. for playing live. No. Unfortunately, it comes your, back to the old Mark One ear again. Usual ear on. To get it right. Yeah. Uh, there's one other thing I guess I, I would add too for live performance, not for the, the bedroom players so much. But to me, it's it's probably more important to your playing style and confidence and getting yes. the audience to follow you. Yes. It's far more important yeah. than the actual sound. Mm. Yeah. If you're there <coughs> frozen, staring at your guitar, mm. it makes everybody on edge in the audience. Yes. So it's the yeah. whole performance is very I think critical I think so. when you're playing live. Yeah. 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 A slight variation on this, of course, is people who want to play live but then capture it on a video recorder or a video cam. That's sort of a that's a halfway house. It's sort of halfway between a recorded yeah. sound and a live sound. Um, it can work all right, providing the room has got a fairly dead acoustic. Like the that's room right. We're in They're pretty here. forgiving, actually. I've, yeah. I've found in the past, uh, the recording on well, in the old days on a cassette. You know, yes. or a ghetto blaster thing or yes. whatever because they've yeah. got built-in built-in compressors yes. and they yes. can be very forgiving yes. in terms of mm. doing a little balance for you yes. but if you're playing in a very echoey environment yes. uh, it's going to sound horrible yeah it, it does and th there are things you can do uh, a lot of video cameras have a separate microphone input for example yeah. so in that case you could put a microphone on your guitar amplifier 
you could run through a simple little mix of the backing track and you can then start to get a very good recorded sound yeah. um, which is basically what we did for video three yeah mm. that's but you won't have possible. to record it a couple of times to get the balance oh right. indeed yes we're yeah. making sure it's, <laughs> it's, it's not yeah. just a sit course, down and do of course of yeah. course yeah. Yeah. Um, so paul why do we why do we use um shadows backing tracks as opposed to say for example uv hank backing tracks yeah why paul yeah why <laughs> People probably know that Gary did the UB Hank backing tracks. I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, th did. There's a very simple demonstration that we that we can show you to try and illustrate why this is important. A, a well-known uh, visual experiment is to put a coloured dot against different coloured backgrounds. Now we will show you on the video just two different coloured backgrounds, and if you look at the two dots you'll probably think that they're different colours. But if we now show the dots without the backgrounds, you can in fact see they're the same colour. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same with hearing. If we embed the same lead track uh, against a UB Hank backing or against a Shadows backing, it will tend to sound different. The notes are the yeah. same, yeah. but the tonal colours will be quite yeah. different. Yes. And so when we're trying to compare our work with the originals, we have to use a shadow. It makes sense, backing. doesn't it? We have to use yeah, the shadows sure, yeah, backing sure, yeah. to have yeah. that same coloured yeah. background so that you can see if yeah. the dot is in fact the same yeah. colour as Hank's dot. And that's so what people are asking for us to do. That's right. Of course you it's it's not all shadows tracks can you remove Hank from. No. Only those where it was recorded originally in stereo mm. can you mm. do this. And if Hank's uh, lead guitar isn't completely removed, it colours the sound and it becomes a fudge. So we only do it where we can remove 99.9% .9 of Hank's sound and then yeah. impose our lead sound on it. Yes, yes. Um, uh, another interesting thing that we've done is then take that same lead sound that is very close to Hank's and then put it against a different backing and in fact it sounds a bit different. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. <coughs> to do a direct A-B comparison, yeah. that's why we've done it. Playing for yourself, use whatever backing satisfies you, I think. I'm Absolutely really right. And I should say about the UB Hank stuff, <laughs> but when, no, honestly, I shouldn't say it. Uh, By now, no, 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 with really. steak knives. Yeah, 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 with steak knives. <laughs> Uh, but when we first started doing it, it was back in 1994 when we first started mm. doing the UB Hank stuff. Yeah. And I had no idea that there were going to be shadows, clubs, and yes. whatever. This was just, uh, you know, I, I, I was asked to do them by, by a Chinese doctor who wanted some karaoke <laughs> shadows stuff. Yes. And it was just stuff to play along to because there were no backing tracks yes. in those days. And you couldn't take Hank out of records either, yes, in right. those days. Yes. So the idea of actually trying to recreate the shadow sound, yes. which is even more difficult than trying to recreate Hank's sound. Yes, yes. Um, yes. It wasn't, yeah. wasn't in, in, in our minds at the time, so yes. uh, that's, that's my excuse and I'm <laughs> sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Miyazaki gave this characteristic, rather magic sound, yes, and, yes. and and the TVS does that. Yes, we've designed in the, the same TVS. way. Yeah, we've designed the TVS to fill that gap, mm. and that's mm. why we've used it. And I think we've demonstrated in video three that it mm. it delivers in. Yes, the, provided yeah. everything else is set up properly. Mm. Yes, and played. So th that's a brief example of how how we've gone about getting the sort of sound we get. Mm. Uh, is it perfect? No, no, uh, never will be. We've got different era, different, different players, different equipment, but we think it's at least satisfying. We were talking about this earlier, I mean, we never really, I mean, no one, it's like trying to recreate Marilyn Monroe or something, I mean, you, you, you find someone who looks pretty close, but it's never going to be the same. No, it, it, ever. so you, you can just take steps at getting ah. closer and closer. And one of the interesting it, yeah. things, I think, was a, a quote from an interview with uh, Malcolm Addy, uh, that great recorder of the early songs. Um, and he talks about how they manage to get a feeling of 3D just in simple mono records like Apache. You know, when you listen to it, it seems to envelop you all around. It's not just a flat wall of sound. Yeah. And that's where he talks about the subtleties of acoustic recording, you know, rec mm. recording live instruments, and the importance actually of the room you recorded in. Here we're very close mic because of the recording environment, and that's partly contributing to our noise issue. Yes. Um, but he spent a lot of time moving the microphone away from the speaker a bit and back again just to get enough room ambience to start yeah. getting that air around it and yeah. that life. Yeah. And you could play around with that 
till the cows come home, I'm sure, and yes, get a bit yes, closer. Yes. But we're sort of fairly happy, I guess, with where we've got it. The, yeah. the important thing, though, I think in that situation is not to get frustrated with it to the point no. that you're not enjoying it anymore. Mm. It's to play around. Yes. Put an equaliser in there and try trimming the top down, bring the bottom up, put a bit of a dip in the middle. You've, you can only get there by training your ear and you can only do that, get there by doing it. Mm. And that's where the fun of it is because you can start to understand then how it all interacts. You've got to be patient. It can be frustrating. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it can take a while to do. Mm. But you can, every stage, you can get more satisfaction as you go along and that's mm. the key thing. That's true. Yeah. No, as, as long as you keep your sense of fun about it, yeah. that's, that's really right. what it's about. But if you've got the right sound that you, that you like, yeah. It makes you want to play more. It, yeah. it really yeah. makes you enjoy music more. Yeah. Um, as opposed to a dull, you know, non-exciting sound. Yeah, you, know, right. you know, mm. you know. Oh, look, I love the sound. You know, yeah. it's, you yeah. know, let's yeah. play some more. Yeah. Again, getting back to this question, what if you don't have this amp and that echo unit and yeah. all the rest of it and these microphones? Yeah. The objective is is to make music and have fun and be inspired by yes. Hank and the Shadows. And that's yes. what that's what drives us along at the yes. end of the day. We've yeah. simply developed it to this degree. Yeah. Um, and if, if you have a, a, a different echo unit, less sophisticated echo unit, and you don't have an amp and you're using amp modelling and so on, mm. so what? Mm. The important thing is to be making the music and enjoying the music as you go yeah, along. Fun. And there's still a challenge there. Yeah, you can tweak this and that and get closer, and that's the thrill mm. of the chase. That's what yes. keeps us going. Yes. But playing's far more important than not playing. Oh, I think it is. <laughs> and I've certainly noticed through doing the few gigs that I, <clears throat> that I do do, playing shadow stuff, um, if you get it right, if you get the kind of vibe of it right, yeah. uh, you can really stop a yep. certain generation in its in its tracks, yep. as it were, because right. it, it, it brings back a lot of memories. Yep.